Creme 2 News begins now. Thank you for joining us on Creme 2 Plus. I'm Tim Pham. This is your Creme 2 News Week in Review. Join us as we take a closer look at some of the biggest stories in the Inland Northwest this past week. As soon as the fire sparked yesterday afternoon, it immediately was threatening 20 plus homes. As soon as neighbors noticed that plume of smoke, they grabbed their water trucks and other equipment to help fight that fire from their neighbor's property. Despite the color, Matt Perkins red pickup is not a fire truck. But when the West Hallett Road fire sparked, that did not stop Matt. When I came in there in my pickup, I'm actually surprised that they were like, you know, well, this road's closed, this road's closed. I'm like, I, I gotta get back there. By there, he means straight into the level three evacuation zone. So I was off Cheney Spokane Road, and I know people in that direction, so went up that way. He ended up on his friend's property. And then I get a phone call from one of my guys. He's like, I'm in a loader, I'm on my way. I'm like, cool, we'll cut fire lines. Called the other guy, it was like, fill the water truck. He come down. By the time they got there, the fire was already coming up the hill. 50, 60 feet away from where the structure started. Well, another different day at the office here, just trying to put out fires. So we just ran fire hose down there and I just started putting out, you know, all the flames that I could. If you can't tell, Matt's pretty humble about his firefighting efforts. You know, I don't want to see anybody lose anything. So, I don't know, it's the right thing to do. And fires happen often out here. Every year, every year something comes through. But this year, Matt was much closer to the action than usual. Well, I got dumped on by one of, one of the planes came across. Well, not one, there was a million of them, but oh yeah, dump, dumped on us. I'm just like, winds down like this as I'm holding the fire hose. <laughs> Between that air support, the ground crews, and of course, Matt and his crew, the fire was not able to burn any houses. In Cheney, Nicole Hernandez, Crem 2 News. It's been an incredibly busy few days for firefighters dealing with both the West Hallett fire and the West Anderson fire near Cheney. But it's not just fire crews that are dealing with this and impacted, it's also people. It's been a long night for Tony O'Neill after the Wes Anderson fire forced his family to evacuate. It's scary. It's so unnerving. You, you spend a lot of time and a lot of your life building things up and uh, have the potential of it just suddenly disappearing. They returned home after evacuations downgraded to level two, but the fire picked up again Thursday afternoon, bringing more smoke, aircraft and anxiety to O'Neill, especially for what it's doing to his vacation plans. It sucks because it's like it's like impacting my walleye fishing. <laughs> the West Anderson fire is just one of multiple that claimed acreage near Cheney this week, beginning with Tuesday's West Hallett fire. According to the Washington State Department of Natural Resources, the fire 60% contained as of Thursday and burned about 155 acres. Meanwhile, the West Anderson fires burned at least 35 acres. Aircraft spent a good chunk of Thursday dropping water on the fire. While recent fires have led to evacuations, DNR's Eric Keller says they've been lucky to keep many of these fires they respond to small. We have lots of resources available right now. We have multiple air resources and that's what helps us catch the fires and keep them small. As crews continue to tackle these fires and others popping up. Is that a new fire? Just now. Really? Yeah. O'Neill says he's ready. If I start to actually see the flames coming, I'm out of here. If the winds move against his favor. The cause of both fires remain under investigation. Near Cheney, Cody Proctor, Krem 2 News. Tonight, the Spokane Fire Department says it's certain. Without the help of planes and helicopters, homes along the Sunset Highway would have burned. You saved hundreds of homes and, and lots and lots of people's lives. Carolyn O'Neill has a home here. I think it's really interesting. You'll figure out what you value in 15, 20 minutes. So it was like documents, the dog, computers, and that's about it. O'Neill smelled the smoke before she saw it. I called kind of like the onslaught of neighbors and what is this? Where do we go to find the information? So we were on, I was on CRIM2 and uh, like Facebook pages. The Spokane Fire Department says the fire was reported at 1:57 this afternoon. Officials say it started behind the Catholic Charities shelter. Just kept getting bigger. The problem was every time we turned around, we had spot fires going somewhere else. So it did jump the road. It started on the south side of the highway here. Even with additional crews, firefighters were quickly overwhelmed. But thanks to air resources, the fire did not cross into the Sunset Hills neighborhood. But residents like O'Neill were still evacuated. It's my first evacuation, so I didn't know what the protocol was. So I'm like, do you just bounce when you get the series? I don't even know what a level three is. Is that like worse than a 
five? Do we have a five? I don't know. Tonight, evacuation levels were lowered to level one or get ready for homes north of the Sunset Highway. We really only out of our houses for maybe two hours. I mean, that's incredible. And the police department with all the notifications, like they did an incredible job. The fire is now under control and will be monitored through the night. Spokane Fire says no injuries have been reported and no structures lost. Officials estimate the amount of property saved will be in the millions. It's a little too close for home, but the, the Spokane Fire Department Kick some serious butt. They were on it. In Spokane, Kyle Simchuk, Krem 2 News. This plot of land is set to be a lot of things. The town hall, a fire station, and the post office. But maybe most importantly, it's going to be the marker of resiliency for the city of Malden. Tuesday, Malden took its first step. Or first shovel toward rebuilding. That's how Mayor Dan Harwood sees this groundbreaking. Today is the mark of almost two and a half years worth of hard work. And uh, it's taken a while, but we're here. Labor Day 2020, the Bab Road fire burned most of Malden and Pine City to the ground. With 80% of the two towns destroyed, some say the future looked uncertain. For a while, it looked like it was almost hopeless that Malden would never come back. But Tuesday, the future was clear. Because of this building that we're going to break ground on today, it will contain the U.S. Post Office for, for Malden. Here we go. A new post office, town hall, and fire station will soon be built in Malden. There really is a lot of work that's gone into this. And this old shovel was new before the fire. It survived the fire. It's with pride that I helped break the ground with this. With everybody, one, two, three. We believed in it and this was the mission and it's mission accomplished. So the next time you drive through Malden, take a look around because that might be the last time you see a town looking to rebuild. What you may see is a town rebuilt. Officials tell me that construction is set to begin as early as tomorrow, with the post office set to be completed in 90 days and the final building completed in 200 days. From Malden, Janelle Finch, Crumpt News. This crowd here gathered for the election party for Nadine Woodward is in pretty high spirits and optimistic about how things might play out going into the general election. Right after the preliminary unofficial results came in, Woodward said she knew it would be a tight race, especially with conservative votes split between Woodward and Tim Archer, both running for Spokane mayor. Going into the general election, Woodward told me she's hoping Tim Archer's supporters will help get her across the finish line in the race against Lisa Brown. I believe that uh, I will be able to pick up the votes that went to Tim Archer. Um, I don't think that his supporters can, can get behind Lisa. And you know, when you have to split the vote in the primary, it kind of gives you an idea of, of the, the ground that you have to gain in the general election. And I believe that we can do that. Kim Please was also here at the election party. She is running for Spokane City Council president. Andy Rathbun, who dropped out of the race, called Please and officially conceded as well. And that's why after those preliminary results came in, Please said she was hoping her other opponent, Betsy Wilkerson, would concede as well so that she could get right to work. Our city council needs to have new leadership. And, you know, I consider myself a leader. I've been a business owner for 32 years. And, you know, I'm looking forward to making my hometown an even better place to live. All candidates here tonight are feeling positive about the road to the general election and eager to get to work. Amanda Rowley, Krem 2 News. Tonight's watch party ended shortly after those results came in. People left here around nine, but they were leaving very feeling very happy, very optimistic, seeing Lisa Brown leading in this mayoral primary and Betsy Wilkerson leading in the race for Spokane City Council president. Now, Brown says she has a better way to get Spokane moving forward again. Her priorities include increasing neighborhood safety, Spokane's housing supply and building a regional coalition to address homelessness. Now, Brown spoke for about 12 minutes right after those results came in and she spent a good amount of time going after Mayor Nadine Woodward, who she says has been an ineffective leader. People want a compassionate and effective response to homelessness. Right now we have neither. 
People in Spokane believe you can help people and hold repeat offenders accountable. They believe we can support and respect law enforcement and first responders for the hard work and the personal risk they take and that we can have accountability so that allegations of misconduct are investigated independently and all neighborhoods and communities get equal treatment, good response rates, and response rates. Now Brown joined Councilwoman Betsy Wilkerson, who again is running for Spokane City Council President. She has many of the same priorities as Brown, public safety, homelessness, and housing, and prioritizing small businesses. She brought her grandkids on stage tonight and says they are what inspired her to make Spokane a better place. So I am looking forward to partnering with Lisa. We don't get along all the time. Be real, we're two women. <laughs> but that will not stand in our way for progress. I really believe Spokane is on the cusp of greatness. I mean, you can just feel it. We are so ready for our next chapter to move ahead. And with your support, we can do that. And Brown and Wilkerson tonight reminding voters that if they didn't vote in this primary or didn't remember to get their ballots in, that they have a second chance to support them this November. Ethan Chapin's memory continues to live on in new ways. Ethan and his family spent many summers here at the Hills Resort at Priest Lake, but this summer would be the first without him. But now and for every summer, there's a special place to remember and celebrate his life. Hills Resort says the Chapins have been guests through multiple generations. Their family has been coming forever. Marketing and event specialist Whitney Hutchins would know. I'm also one of the family members, um, so I grew up here uh, and third generation. Plenty of people come and go at the resort, but Ethan Chapin made a lasting impact as a guest, employee, and friend. Losing Ethan was tremendous. I mean, that loss is tremendous, and I, I can't really articulate how, how big it is for so many people. I mean, he touched everybody's life. He was one of four University of Idaho students murdered last November. To help those still feeling the loss, the volleyball court and a new bench now hold Ethan's name. Could just always find him here. He was playing with staff. He was playing with guests. He just, he was, oh, I mean, he was always playing. Like he was just always smiling and laughing and playing. The Chapins were common challengers on the court for Chris Zylak and his family. We've had a lot of fun battles on this volleyball court. He says his kids grew up alongside the Chapins at the resort. For all of them and us to experience a tragedy like this, is, it's been tough. Zylak says his family wanted a way to remember their best memories with Ethan. It was their idea to create the bench in his honor. We thought through it a lot of different ways of what would be something that would be a uh, permanent, meaningful uh, way of honoring him. And this just seemed to be right on, hit, check all the boxes. The Chapins had a role in installing the bench. Ethan's mom, Stacy, posted on Instagram saying in part, I know Ethan is always here at the lake but this is something physical that allows everyone to remember his joy, laughter, and love of life. She ended her post encouraging people to stop by and have a seat with someone you love. And there's more to come to this dedication. I'm told that there will be several tulips planted around the bench as a symbol of Ethan's time working at a Western Washington tulip farm. From Priest Lake, Janelle Finch, Crumpt News. U.S. Senator Maria Cantwell stopped in Spokane as part of a series of fentanyl roundtables to hear how this deadly opioid is impacting our region. And some of what she heard shocked her. The first step in really fighting this uh, epidemic is knowledge and information. Monday, U.S. Senator Maria Cantwell heard about the deadly grip of fentanyl from those who lived through abusing it. And it got stronger and stronger, and it's harder to get off of it and those providing life-saving treatment. Many of those providers say a lack of funding is hindering efforts to serve overwhelming numbers in need in Spokane County. What we've seen with Maddie's place, unfortunately, is just a lot of um, hoops to have to jump through to try and get our services paid for. Others say more money could fill Eastern Washington's lack of detox beds. If we could waive that 16 bed limit, you think you could see four more people a day? Easily. Easily. Okay. 
Cantwell says Medicare may play a role in filling those gaps. Communities are telling us if they just had more capacity with workforce, with behavioral health, with beds, they could do a lot more to stem the tide. She's also looking at licensing regulations for behavioral health care providers to deal with staffing shortages. We got to we got to get creative scramble and get hybrids of professionals working in this field. And now with Spokane Regional Health looking to collaborate on a pilot project with other providers, the conversation is far from over. This roundtable tour comes after the passage of the federal Fend Off Act, which targets international fentanyl trafficking and money laundering. Shannon Mowdy, CREM2 News. Looking at a plane that's still sitting in Priest Lake, two adults and one child are lucky to be alive today. I spoke to a volunteer firefighter who described the efforts to save those on board. Of all the things floating in Priest Lake, only one thing is catching everyone's attention. Three people in the plane didn't quite clear this tree right behind us. Plane that likely took off from the Cavanaugh Bay Airport a few hundred feet away and crashing down just before 4 p.m. Sunday. Priest Lake Fire volunteer Keith Hansen was at the scene helping the injured passengers. Pilot had a head wound. The female passenger had some injuries to her face. There was a young, young boy in the back who was uh, not physically injured, but pretty shaken up. A popular beach with no one else hurt. People are thankful to have not been in the wrong place at the wrong time. Fortunately for a, for a bad situation, it could have been much worse. Walk along the beach. That upper window is broken out. And evidence of the crash goes beyond just the plane. We've got the landing gear, which was torn off. The Bonner County Undersheriff says the plane is not leaking fuel into the lake and it's still safe to access the beach. But from today on, people will likely pay closer attention. Oh, there goes the plane right now. They're just The plane's flying over them at Priest Lake. The Bonner County Undersheriff tells me all passengers' injuries are non-life-threatening. And he also says that the plane will remain in the lake until the FFA and NTSB conclude their investigations. From Priest Lake, Janelle Finch, Crumpton News. Just a quick drive through this neighborhood, you may not get the full picture. But if you go ahead and ask anyone around, they'll paint a clear vision of what makes this a special community. Uh, why not Hilliard would be my response to that. Take Michael Katsala for example. He's a co-owner of Derailer Coffee inside of a newly renovated building located in the heart of Hilliard. You know, most people in Spokane think Hilliard's a, a rough part of town. But it's a beautiful part of town. It's part of the history of Spokane with the rail yards, all of those things. That same history Michael is talking about surrounds him every single day. And did we mention that his business isn't the only one under this roof? You know, so it's kind of neat hearing about what it was like, you know, in the World War II era. Locos is just on the opposite side of the room. So you've got food, you've got beer, you've got coffee. Three separate ideas coexisting in the same space with plans for more entrepreneurs to move upstairs. A gentleman and his wife came in and had dinner the other night and told me this was the first place he ever had a bank account in 1948. So yeah, there's a little bit of history around here and the pride that comes from this concept is something longtime residents have embraced. It's also a sign of what's in store for the future. We actually have our meetings here. I mean, now that they're open. Sean Facette, organizer and president of the annual Hilliard Festival, has called this neighborhood home all of his life. So, having a new location to brainstorm an event for the place he loves, it's a perfect match. If you, if you come and watch us this weekend, you will see why I'm here. The community bonds together. A community that's all in on building, growing, and shining a positive light on a neighborhood that's booming. Great things come out of Hilliard. From Hilliard, Brandon T. Jones, Crum2 News.
The first day of fall camp for Washington State football is officially in the books. Edge rushers Ron Stone Jr. and Brennan Jackson have been key cogs for the Cougs over the past half decade, but today was their last first. I mean, when you look back on getting here in 2018, thinking that, hey, you're st still going to be a college athlete in 2023, I was like, oh, you know, I wouldn't have believed you, but no, it's been an amazing journey thus far, and you know, with all the trials and tribulations being here with a team like this, with the guys that, you know, I call my brothers, I'm super excited for one more last ride. It's no regrets and to just look forward to the year and, and to really enjoy it. You know, uh, it's my last year of college football ever. So uh, really just embrace that and uh, be thankful for it. While Jackson and Stone are the vets on this Cougs team, they're learning a new defense like everyone else. Spokane native Jeff Schmetting was hired to take over as defensive coordinator after spending the past two seasons at Auburn. It's, it's the same base defense, but he has his own flavor and twist to it. That I'm looking forward to you. I'm loving it. I think he has a really good vision for our defense. Like I said, there's not too many changes to our scheme overall, which is good because, you know, that just means there's a lot of carryover. The offense will look different this season as well. Cam Ward is back for season two as the starting quarterback, but he also is learning a new playbook as Ben Arbuckle has taken over as the new offensive coordinator after two years at Western Kentucky. I feel like change is good, um, depending on who you are. Change is great for this team, uh, but a lot of things transferred over from the last offense, and there are a little, you know, tasks, Coach Buck, that has brought from West Kentucky, but I think the biggest thing that he's just want us to do is just play hard. And now the countdown begins. WSU's season opener is a month away. We only get 15 of these before school starts. We got to maximize every one. Uh, excited about getting things kicked off though. Washington State has made seven straight bowl games, hoping to make it eight straight here in 2023. Reporting in Pullman, Travis Green, Crim2 Sports. Day one of fall camp for the Eastern Washington Eagles is officially in the books and coming off of a disappointing season last season, the team has had a busy offseason trying to bring more energy and togetherness heading into 2023. I mean, the energy is a lot different from last year. Uh, I can feel it. I mean, we've built something pretty special these past six months and we're not stopping now. We did a lot of off-season training more than we ever have, um, not just in the weight room, but we, we needed to challenge the mentality of this football team um, in January and not wait until February or March. Uh, we had a down year and that may be the best thing for us when it's all said and done. A lot of guys, you know, are spending extra time in the weight room, uh, studying film and, you know, doing their best to mentally prepare for it, you know, so they can have that confidence not only for themselves, but for guys next to them. The Eagle offense is under the direction of new starting quarterback, Keikoa Viceparis. He is proud of the work he has put in to earn this opportunity. I didn't get here just like by God. Uh, it's, it's a lot of what my coaches has done and even myself. So it's cool to just reflect to see where I've came from since day one, not really even knowing any of the plays and almost being a wildcat quarterback to now, like understanding uh, read progressions and, and defenses, coverages. So just my progress has been really interesting to see. The Eagles' first scrimmage at Roos Field is set for August 19th. For now, reporting in Cheney, Andrew Quinn, Crumb 2 Sports. Year two of the Jason Eck era in Moscow is officially underway with the beginning of fall camp today. The Idaho Vandals took to the field today for the first time, and the feeling among players is a sense of total comfortability after last season's success. I'm just getting more and more, more and more comfortable each day, you know, each practice, and um, and um, I feel good back there. It was just a great first day. Um, and um, it was a great start to uh, camp and it's just time to keep stacking days. So it was a great feeling. We've just gotten closer like as a team chemistry wise. I don't think it's really changed. We've always known the players we've had here in this program. Um, but I think just we're just getting closer and just getting better together and everyone's on the same page now. As the returners continue to master the playbook in year two, the Vandal Vets also must help lead a large group of newcomers to the program. Out of our 110 guys we have in camp, uh, 52 of them were not here last fall, so it's a pretty uh, large number. So we had to do a great job of evaluating those guys and see who can help us. Following last season, the blueprint is in place to follow. We're all going to buy into this program. We saw what it did last year. We saw how quickly we could turn things around. So it, it gets to the point where it's like, hey, guys, it works. Listen to what coaches have to say. Buy into the team. Watch the older guys and, and you know, let's, let's start building this legacy. The consensus top 10 ranked Vandals will begin their season on the final day of August against Lamar on the road in Beaumont, Texas. For now, reporting at the Kibbe Dome in Moscow, Andrew Quinn, Krem2 Sports. Bye, Dad. This look familiar? Love you, Dad. 
Well, it should, because that's Spokane. Talk to you about this. Where the new feature film Dreamin' Wild is set. I wanted to try as hard as we could to do it in the real place. Director Bill Pullhead started writing the movie years ago. I had written the, the story and the script based on uh, the real farm, the real the people that I knew and the geography of the farm. That farm just two hours north of Spokane in Fruitland, Washington, where Donnie and Joe Emerson created the Dream and Wild album that inspired the movie. It's just a feeling I can't, I can't explain. This Unreal. Donnie has already watched the movie seven times. And every time it's just it's just been over overwhelming. Do it. That music you hear in the background, that's Donnie. Nancy and I worked on all that, all that pretty much all that music, the remixes and everything. But Joe Emerson says the movie is about more than just music. It's a lot about the music in that album that we did. But it does resonate as a family family situations and happenings. Family, relationships, and dreams. I hope they come away with it's important to stay connected to family. Which is exactly what the Emersons have done over the years. It's so hard to, 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 to really pin down an emotion when I saw it because I was crying so much through it. So many different emotions going through me, even now. You can see the movie in theaters starting today. In Spokane, Nicole Hernandez, Crumb 2 News. Hi, my dear. How you doing? Good. <laughs> I'm Bob Reimer. I volunteered here at the American Red Cross for 30 years. I retired when I was 60, and after two years, my wife said, go find something to do. This is a storage room that I maintain. We help people to try and get started after they've had a disaster, whatever that may be, large or small. It may be initially just providing maybe a, a motel room for a night until they can get back into their house, and if they can get back in. Primarily, I would go out on, on fires or floods or whatever uh, as we had at that time, and then slowly I got into logistics now I maintain the building. I'm Summer Warfield. I'm the Disaster Program Manager for the Greater Inland Northwest Chapter of the Red Cross. I have seen the best of humanity in the worst of situations here. Bob's wonderful. Bob's such a warm, friendly smile. He's greeting. He's supportive. He's welcoming. We have, what, at least over half of the state working out of the two offices here. Everybody in the state knows about Bob. If they haven't met Bob, they know of Bob. He is just a wealth of information and historical knowledge about the chapter, about things that we've done and responses over the years, and it's just so great to have him around. Volunteers are the, are the heart, really, of Red Cross. My name is Brittany Holden. I'm the Life Enrichment Director for Touchmark on South Hill. I am one of Bob's neighbors. My favorite Bob story is when we had one of the famous Spokane power outages, and Five minutes after the power went out, Bob came across the hall and brought me a flashlight with batteries because he's always prepared and always ready to take care of a neighbor. I need about 100 more Bobs. <laughs> Thank you for joining us here on Creme 2 Plus for a look at some of the biggest news stories of the past week. For the most current news throughout the weekend, you can watch our latest newscast right here on Creme 2 Plus. Just look for them in the bottom navigation menu. I'm Tim Pham. Thanks for watching.